what I want to talk about for the next few minutes is a little bit about that sort of thought process about well how do we how do we get to these 10x these moonshot ideas and what are the things that sometimes stop us from getting to thinking in those terms I think what we need to keep asking ourselves is well what is the perceived wisdom in terms of the issue that we are dealing with and I'm going to talk about the perceived wisdom of mapping as it was. The perceived wisdom once upon a time, not so long ago, was that web search was solved. There were no big issues from a research point of view, from a product marketing point of view. If you wanted to search, you might go to a site like AltaVista and that would have everything that you needed. It was how you interacted with the web, it was how you searched. Why did you need Google? Why did you need two guys working in a garage to come up with a different approach to web search. That very radical, clean, original Google web page broke perceived wisdom at the time. What I do in terms of cartography and mapping, you could argue there was already a perceived wisdom. This is a, a personal uh, hero, heroine of mine. This is Phyllis Purcell who was the founder of the A to Z Maps Company. And the story goes, and it may be you know, an apocryphal one, that she was coming back from a party in the 1930s and got lost, you know, walking in the streets of London. And she decided the very next day that that was never going to happen to her again. And the A to Z map was job done. That's what she needed to navigate around the London. And probably, most of us at home have an A to Z map. This was mapping solved. So he said, perceived wisdom. I'm going to put this down here. But was it? And of course, we now look today at Google Maps and we think how different that is to a traditional street atlas. And I'm going to take you through some of the characteristics that make maps work really well. And as I'm going through those characteristics, think back about this paper map, not necessarily an A to Z map, but any map that's printed on paper, and think how it corresponds to some of these factors that I'm talking about. So for a map to be useful, there are four W's that we need to deal with. Where, who, why, and when. And I'm going to deal with each one of those separately and look at how indeed at Google we broke with perceived wisdom. Let's deal with where. Where has two meanings here. Where in terms of where can I get mapping data from, and the other where that is something that has really only become possible in the last 10 years or so with technology change is actually where am I? And where am I in relation to everything else? This map that you can see deals with a where that has often challenged cartographers and mapping. It's actually a map of Pyongyang, not somewhere that traditionally was very easy to get maps of. Certainly, if you want to get a job as a cartographer in North Korea, it's a very difficult one. So the perception was, well, you can't really create a global map. You certainly can't create a global map that contains high-resolution imagery. You can't create a global map that contains images that were taken from a car, 360-degree immersive view, for tens of millions of miles. You can't do that because, wow, that's just too difficult. It's too expensive to collect. It will be too complex to do. It's funny when we think about it, when Google Earth started, when Google uh, actually acquired a company called Keyhole, Google Earth only covered North America because it just wasn't possible to get imagery uh, for the rest of the world with any sort of business model that seemed to work for the company. When they were acquired by Google, one of the first things that changed was just go and buy imagery from wherever you can because we want this to be a global product. We don't mind that this has never been done before, that it's never been possible to collect imagery for the whole planet. We're just going to go and do it because we'll have users covering the whole planet. So where means that we have to be universal in our coverage. We have to be 
universal in terms of the detail and the consistency and the accuracy of the data so that the data is as accurate in London as as accurate as it is in Kampala in Uganda. It should be the same everywhere. The other where, as represented here by the uh, mobile phone Google Map, is actually indoors. This is Google Maps uh, inside the Peter Jones store, John Lewis store in uh, London. And it's showing that I'm on the fourth floor, and it shows, me, it shows you that I'm in the uh, home furnishing department near Mirrors. You can see where that little blue arrow is. This is solving two problems that really are radical from a mapping point of view. It's very difficult to map indoors. And yet, we spend about 70% of our living lives indoors. But conventionally, maps stopped when you went inside. Certainly what stopped was the ability to actually locate where you were. GPS doesn't work indoors. So we had to think about ways of, well, what other technology could we use? Well, we can use our cell phones, and we can use Wi-Fi. We can use the fact that we have millions of users with those cell phones walking about in stores and places like this, building up databases of their location, which we can then use to identify where you are. The next W is why. When you buy your A to Z or your uh, traditional map, the map you buy is the same map that everybody else buys. Because, of course, it's printed, and you can't change what's on the map. So maps tend to be very general in their purpose. But actually, it's really useful if the map is specific to the particular task we're trying to do. For example, if I'm trying to get from the Google office in Victoria to here, how should I do it? If I'm using public transport, I can uh, pull in data from our friends at TFL and create a map that is specific to this particular purpose. It gives me the information I need to navigate. The next W is who. We have our friends on G+, or on Facebook, or on Twitter. But it would be nice to bring some of that information, some of that context that our friends bring onto our maps as well. So who means we want to increasingly personalize the content of our maps. If I'm looking for a particular bar or a cafe, why not pull in what my friends know? Pull in the recommendations that they've made on Google+, for example, and have that to uh, customize the contents of my map. And, you know, I trust my friends. They've got reasonable taste in restaurants, but maybe I want to pull in information from, I don't know, people with greater expertise. Agat is, you know, a globally recognized restaurant brand. We can pull in their content as well. So this is my map, really of restaurants. The final W, the final perceived wisdom that we had to destroy, was when. When, again, means two things here. When means that the information that I need to display or portray on my map has to be up to date. Again, not like my paper uh, street atlas that was published two, three years ago and was accurate at that point in time. I want my map to be in real time, to be up to date, to reflect the changes in the real world. On average, there's a turnover in your high street of about 20% every year. Businesses, retail chains go in and out of business, new stores open and so on. There's no point having a map that's three, three years old if I'm trying to find a store that closed uh, 18 months ago. Things like the traffic, the travel network are dynamic, weather is dynamic. So the when should reflect the fact that the real world is continually changing and the maps should reflect that. The other when is where do those maps come from? When do you use them? So actually, when means that you can see the Google map not just on Google's website, but you can see it when you use other people's websites. Now, this isn't Google Earth, although actually you can recreate this view in Google Earth because we have a view of the moon and we have Google Earth and you can, you can do this. This is, of course, the famous Earthrise picture that was taken from Apollo 8 in December of 1968. This was by far the most risky mission, more so than landing on the moon, because this was the first time 
that men had ever left Earth orbit. We traveled far further on this mission than we'd ever done before. And a lot of the people involved thought, well, you know, this is kind of 50-50 whether this would work. Really, one of those things, well, let's, let's judge the risk. When you break perceived thinking, it can be quite scary. You can do things that put you out of your comfort zone. But you have to do that if you're going to really make that big shift in progress, not 10 times, not 100 times. Actually, in this case, the growth was 1,000 times. We traveled 1,000 times further than we'd ever traveled before as humans. We'd gone from Earth orbit, which was about 250 miles, to 250,000 miles to get us to the moon, and a 1,000x jump. No wonder that was kind of scary. No wonder that was a little frightening. But we need that. We need that scary fear factor to make those big jumps. So what's our big scary jump? What we now want to do is that every map that we create is unique. And it's unique because of you, the user, that's created that map, and for the particular use you want to use that map for. So our big jump, our moonshot, is to make every map different. And that's a challenge when you make one million maps a month. So last week, we introduced a new interface to Google Maps. This is a screenshot of it. And this is my map. Only I will see this map because it's specific to me. I'm logged in using my Google account. This is my own local area uh, in uh, southwest London, in Teddington. My home is that icon there. You can see some businesses that are kind of highlighted more so than others. Those are building businesses that I have visited or I visit frequently. If you produced a map of Teddington, your map would look different. You also see links to all of the imagery that's in the neighborhood, e be it street view imagery or people who have geocoded photos, publish them on the web. Those photos provide an amazing sense of place. What does it actually feel like to visit this place? And we are gathering photos, millions and millions of geocoded photos every week, putting those online. You can access them from this interface. And that's a really important way of thinking about geospatial information, about mapping, about the world around us, because we think quite visually. And if I then decided, well, actually, I wanted a map that uh, would take me from where I live at home to uh, a local bar in Richmond, the map itself would change. The labels would change, dynamically representing my needs. So every map that I now produce is specific to me. And it's done so because of all of the content that we have in that huge database of three-dimensional data and because it knows me as an individual. That contextual information is really, really powerful. That's contextual information here represented in a map, but in the future, maybe that will be represented in different ways. Maybe I'll have an earpiece that is talking to me, telling me about my local neighborhood, telling me when the bus is going to arrive that I need to take, telling me that my friend is in the bar just across the road, and he's sitting towards the back so you can actually find him. All of that information is there and is accessible and will be increasingly accessible in very customized maps or in other ways. And it will become that assistant, that virtual guide that kind of is there standing behind you, helping you out, your, your co-pilot in life, helping you to make those decisions so you can deal with the, the important pressing things at a particular point in time while they look after the other situational awareness as such that you need to be aware of. We can only do this, and actually, as a company, only we can do this because of the content that we have created, but also because of the infrastructure that we have. <laughs>